Okay, let's go ahead and get started. On behalf of the New York City Board of Correction, I want to welcome everyone here today. And first, I'd like to have my colleagues introduce themselves, starting with our Vice Chair. Derek Sleepus. Bobby Cohen. Brian Hamill. Michael Regan. Steve Safir. And Jennifer Jones Austin will be joining us shortly. First, if I could have a motion to approve the minutes of our February 10th, 2015 so meeting. Move. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The minutes are adopted. And we've got actually a short agenda, but I was just talking to Dr. Cohen. There's lots, lots here. And our first issue is the enhanced supervision housing. And I really want to thank uh, Board of Correction staff, specifically Ashley, for her work in terms of the report and really detailing what's working, what's what's challenging, um, and and the like. And currently, it's my understanding there are 17 inmates in the enhanced supervision housing. A number of board members uh, have had a chance to visit it since it actually has um, become <coughs> operational. Uh, there was a use of force incident uh, earlier in the week and also an inmate in terms of um, having contraband it was subsequently transferred to uh, the um, state prison. But I think the first thing maybe we could hear from uh, Commissioner Pont in terms of or his staff about their sense of how things are going in terms of ESH or enhanced supervision housing. Commissioner Pont. Good morning everyone. Good morning. Uh, as everyone knows uh, we've done a lot of work, a lot of heavy lifting both from the physical plan to get the either cleaned up and operationalized, uh, a lot of review of inmate files and who to put in there. Um, so we, we've been taking it very slow. As the chair reported, you know, we've had a, a couple of pretty minor incidents uh, for that unit. Uh, we, we've made some uh, fundamental mistakes in, in oversight, uh, minor, but I think the good news is that we've really been on top of these and, and, and in general, all the pieces are working. Uh, Deputy Warden Kelly will talk to you any specific questions they have, but he's there every day. Uh, he selected the officers, the captains, the assistant deputy warden, all those people that are assigned to them every day. So I think, in my opinion, if we looked at, some, you know, uh, initializing a new program, it's gone fairly well. And I think the, uh, you know, we, even from the inmate standpoint, or the inmates that are in that unit, uh, they felt it's, it's operationalized pretty well. So I'll let uh, deputy warden tell us about what. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. As the commissioner mentioned, we are fully operational uh, with the total, as you mentioned, uh, 17 inmates at this time. Uh, everyone, including you know staff and inmates alike, are getting used to the system that is put in place. Uh, the <coughs> regulations and the policies are being enforced daily. Programming has um, started aggressively um, in terms of the Daddy Me program, uh, meditation program, channels curriculum, journal program. So slowly but surely, the inmates are starting to um, perform and, and starting to participate. The first couple of days, um, not as much, but as we're going, and they're starting to see that you know it could benefit them as well. Um, they're starting to take a liking to it. Um, staff is aggressively um, encouraging them to participate. Um, staff is there, you know, pretty much um, steady as of right now. Um, our supervisor is steady, so we're, um, we're giving out the consistent message. Um, the department's mission of um, to make it successful for inmates and staff alike. Yeah. Okay. Just a number of questions. Uh, um, Derek and I visited, you, you visited, right? And, 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 and Gordon has, has visited the, the unit so far. And um, I, I have a few questions. Um, the um, in terms of programs, are people spending time out of their cells, or are they locking? You know, people have a choice to lock in or lock out. Do you have some sense of uh, whether people are locking in or locking out most of the day, most of their seven hours? They are locking out. They're locking out. Yeah. Okay. And the training for the for this group. I mean, one of the documents you provided for us uh, th this week. You talked about the training for CPSU. This is not your document, but is the training for ESH officers the same as the CPSU training? Well, I'll have to take a look to actually see what the training for CPSU, but in terms of the ESH, that's uh, the three-day safe crisis um, management training given by the Correction Academy, um, basic crisis with the Azalee group in terms of mental health, and um, uh, security skills with the emergency service unit. And so there's pieces of it that's the same. There's also pieces that we put into this unit that we're going to add into the uh, CPSU. Oh, I'm, so, I'm, I'm glad to hear that because yeah. uh, what, what, what I was was old what I saw before. So you know, no. okay. And um, 
the um, mental health uh, access at 9 p.m. What was, what's the logic of that of that program rather than people requesting to see mental health and then having a chance to to see them rather than going cell to cell? That was uh, just to do a daily round, mental health round as well as medical. The medical occurs in the morning and the mental health, they, um, which fits for, for both parties involved, they come around at 8 just to you know, do a daily round with cell to cell and check on it. It makes to see if they are requesting um, any additional <coughs> well, in, 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 in the report prepared by uh, DO, um, BOC staff, uh, there was a, a, a prisoner who was requesting mental health services. He had been set up to get to mental health services, but there was no space available because there's only one multi-purpose room, I, b I believe, that's being used for multi for multi-purposes. Um, have you were you aware of that, or um, is there a scheduling for that for that room? Because there are many many programs, and there are limited there's limited program space. Yeah, it's it's limited space, but that was something that would be worked out. It wasn't brought to my attention, but um, in normal scenarios, it would be something that's worked out with the clinic if additional space is needed, so that way we could still afford the, the mental health staff that's served. Right, it, it, it's ideal. So it's not going to be the issue of a room. If the inmate has to go to the clinic to get the services, he'll go to the clinic. So. Okay. To get to that room, multi-purpose room requires a three-point search. Is that right? So you have to be strip searched to go to yes. to, a, to a medical or a mental health yes. uh, visit. Um, the last question has to do with with with, re with recreation. Um, uh, I, are people afforded recreation b um, both groups at the each, each each day? I had heard when when I was there, it was early that uh, basically if you were on the morning lockout group, you you could potentially have. Um, recreation, but if you were um, in the afternoon lockout group, then you did not. No, it's a negative. It, it, the recreation is afforded on, on both on both lockout, meaning the, the morning and the afternoon, um, to the to the inmate population it is uh, afforded, but not it's upon um, it's optional. So with the weather and the icy and the snow conditions, the numbers were relatively low. Not as many you know, inmates in the population wanted to even. Go outside, but it has been. Afforded. There's no indoor recreation available. We're working. We're aggressively working to try to work that out. Okay, thank you. I just have a few questions. Good morning. When do you expect the programming to be fully operational? According to the report provided by our staff, there's really not a lot of programming yet, and enhanced supervision. So when do you expect that to be fully operational for the inmates? Okay. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Judge. Um, actually, we've had um, pretty comprehensive programming that began already. We launched a survey on the day of opening, and it continued throughout the week to determine what the gentleman's preference were. Um, as a result, these are the following programs that have been offered. So we had we kicked off kicked it off with um, a parenting program, Daddy and Me, because we think that. Um, Regardless of the population, people tend to um, gather around family. And so we were able to do that. Um, that program actually ends on Wednesday of this week, tomorrow. We also kicked off um, the Brooklyn Public Library Book Services. So books are actually in the housing area, and we have a librarian that comes every Wednesday and provides books and discussion on books. We have the Step Up Parenting Program that's offered. Um, so far, five um, individuals have been have expressed interest in receiving services. We also have home-based Palladia services coming in to provide homeless prevention advocacy. Anyone who's at risk of being homeless, they get assessed to determine if rent arrears could be paid or if any other double up issues to prevent individuals from going to the shelter is being done. And we also have the challenge curriculum, which um, actually began on March 6th and happens Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Thus far, um, we've had a mixed participation. Everyone is offered, but so far on the first day, seven refused, which was the 9 a.m. Um, the 9 a.m. workshop, and 2 p.m. six individuals participated. So we're still working out to see the individual's engagements and trying to figure out what types of, um, you know, what types of other programs we could offer to engage them further. 
Thank you. Thank you. And my other question just has to do with due process. Uh, what due process is being afforded, and how are the hearings going so far? As of right, as of right now, um, the due process has been according to policy. Um, the adjudication unit has been um, conducting the hearings, and as of right now, everyone that has been placed in it for the hearing has been um, recommended to stay. Okay. And uh, I understand there was an issue originally the hearings were not being taped so that they couldn't be reviewed, but that's been corrected. Is that yes. correct? Yes, Your Honor. They so they're all being taped now, is that right? Yes, they are. Okay, thank you. And um, Heidi, have there been any uh, appeals for Deputy Commissioner Grossman? Uh, right now, we haven't, we're not aware of any appeals at this point in time, but we can check and get back to you. Okay. And, and advise you. Okay. Thank you. Derek. Uh, my question's already been asked and answered. Good. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. And uh, before we turn to enhanced supervision housing, one of the things that I wanted to um, state at the beginning, and there's been discussion at previous board meetings about the need for creating um, committees to focus on our work, and actually with the uh, consensus of the whole board, we're creating five ad hoc committees. We're going to be creating a quarterly death review committee, which will be chaired by Jennifer Jones Austin, an adolescent young adults committee, which will be chaired by Brian Hamill, a strategic planning committee, which I'll chair once we've identified a new executive director, a governance committee chaired by Derek Cephas, and a committee focusing on violence chaired by Bobby Cohen. One of the uh, first order of business is that we'll be asking each of the chairs to work with their respective committees in terms of developing a charter so we're clear in terms of what the intent is and the focus of each respective committee. The other thing is that the city charter requires that an annual report uh, be issued by the Board of Correction. We will be issuing an annual report in early fall for the fiscal year ending June 30th, uh, 2015. So with that, I want to turn to uh, punitive segregation, and we received a letter uh, yesterday, which is very expansive, uh, which is uh, which is very helpful, and we also received a uh, directive. So it would really be helpful, Commissioner, in terms of where you are, uh, which is obviously still a work in progress in terms of implementing the punitive segregation, or Chief Murphy. Chief Murphy, thank you, Chief. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So we. Uh, <coughs> have been implementing the changes to uh, punitive seg since the board uh, had the rule change. Uh, we have removed any inmates that were serving uh, historical time in punitive segregation. Um, inmates who have uh, nonviolent grade one and grade two infraction are in uh, PSEG two with the uh, seven hours of lockout. And we're going through the inmates who are serving um, or have the are going up to the 30-day uh, limit and then the seven-day uh, lockout. Uh, we're continually monitoring that and rolling those inmates out of punitive say to ensure that anyone who has more than 30 days to serve is getting that seven-day lockout before serving any more time past the 30 days. That's being done on a continual basis. And as far as expunging historical time, we have a report that's generated every day. Uh, inmates who are newly admitted to custody that may owe historical time uh, upon admission, we're expunging that time, ensuring that those individuals do not go through punitive segregation unless they reinfract on this current incarceration. So, Chief Murphy, I have a question. For those inmates that are currently incarcerated and had time, how is that playing out? Not for newly admitted, but for inmates that were actually incarcerated at the time the rule was adopted. How, do, how is that working? The, those that were in punitive segregation? Yes. Right. So, what we're doing on the we meet twice weekly now. Every inmate that's in currently in punitive segregation, we look at their anticipated discharge date from punitive seg, and as long as, and anyone who may go past 30 days of service in punitive seg, we're rolling them out of punitive seg, so they did not go past 30 days from the date of the rule change. And then just to follow up, are you actually eliminating or reducing some of the time for inmates, or they would still continue with the understanding that there only could be two 30-day periods? That's, the time still holds with the understanding that they can only do the two 30-day terms in punitive seg unless I do the uh, override, okay. unless I personally review the case and do the override. Okay. Question. Do, do you know um, the numbers in PSU Light and CPSU? And the There's uh, 18, 18 inmates in PS2, and we had 200 inmates in PSEG. 200? Yes. 
Um, it was a 249, the last job that I saw. I guess um, if it'd be possible to provide for the for the board um, what the, the data is just up today, so we'll have some sense okay. of what's going on. I appreciate that. In, e in each of the uh, in each of the punitive segregation uh, uh, units. Thank you. I have a few questions in terms of the backlog that had been building as a result of um, punitive segregation prior to the new rules. What's occurred with that backlog? Is that completely cleared up now? It is not sure of this discussion. It's already sure part of this discussion. Uh, making sure that inmates okay, uh, who are incarcerated, <laughs> incarcerated are only serving time that they incurred during this current incarceration. So if anyone that is was on the backlog for historic time, uh, those guys were not putting in the community. Right. But what about all the other inmates? Because if, if my memory serves me well, we had a backlog of about a 1,000 inmates. And one of the reasons the backlog was building it was because we didn't have the punitive said beds to put them in. So now that we've moved so many out, are we putting those that owe the time in quickly? And, and the long sentences, too, Your Honor. So part of that was you give a 90 day sentence, we're not doing that anymore. Right. So Eric has the best. Uh, Thank you. We, we, we thought, I think initially it was like eight, eight or nine months. So, they just made a little bit quicker on that. so our initial plan as we prepared to implement the rules and looked at the numbers was that it would take us between eight to ten months to clear the backlog, uh, including all of the parameters that we've just discussed. So that is underway. We may, as the commissioner just mentioned, be able to do it a little quicker than that, but we're um, we're working through that list slowly. One of the um, one of the things that we need to make sure is that we're not putting people in who have already served 60 days within the last six months. So it's, um, the background does exist, but we want to be careful about who we put in. And, and All right, and then I have a question. In terms of the seven-day rollout, because they can't serve more than 30 days and they have to be out seven and they can go back in the 30-day, have you or you are, are, are you intending to create some sort of administrative segregation unit where they can go into prior to going back into punitive seg? Or is the plan to put them in ESHU and or general population? So we have an idea of where you plan on moving these inmates. So, I'll let the chief really answer that, but it depends on the inmate. So some inmates may be easier to go back to a population unit. Maybe the inmate that's a little more high custody will go back to a different type of population. Right. So that's that's part of the biweekly uh, meetings that we're having um, to look at those inmates on a case-by-case -case basis. Right? We don't want to have a blanket policy that you, know, you get out and you need to set a day out of punitive seg that we're going to send everybody to X. We want to look at the individual. Uh, if they're nonviolent and they haven't caused any problems uh, or had any issues while in punitive seg, they may be eligible for general population or if they were in protective custody, they'll go back to protective custody. But if someone does rise to the level of uh, admission to ESH, you know, we'll put them there. But it's a case-by-case it's -case basis. And we're meeting uh, every Wednesday and Friday to go over those, uh, those cases and ensure that those inmates are placed in appropriate housing. Thank you. Other, other questions? Thank you. And we've just been joined by Jennifer Jones Austin. <coughs> Welcome. Our next uh, issue, which is actually on the agenda, which is actually very multifaceted, is the whole issue around violence. And I might just want to note, I want to thank Jim Bennett from the New York City Board of Corrections staff. And actually, I think it would be helpful if this was actually put on the Board of Corrections website uh, that talks about monthly slashing and stabbings. And one thing I think it's important to note that's illustrative from this chart is that the number of stabbing and slashing incidents through uh, March of 2015 is higher than the number of all incidents in all of 2007 and all of 2008 and all of 2009 and also in the period when the, the population in terms of the inmates was 3,000 greater than it exists today. And obviously this is something that the department is well aware of and from the commissioner on down are very concerned about. But I think it'd be helpful, Commissioner, if we could hear from you overall about the uh, issues around violence and then to then turn to the um, essentially facility-wide lockdown or the majority of the facilities or jails on Rikers last week and then from there we'll turn to uh, um, RHU and other issues. But let's just start with um, the overall incidence of violence. So yeah, so we've seen a substantial spike in uh, stabbings and slashings over uh, the first quarter of this year. Uh, we looked at every incident. Uh, we tried to zoom down into the what are the driving factors. Obviously, one of our concerns is the availability of weapons uh, uh, in these facilities. 
The other concern for us is is uh, most of the violence is driven by gangs, so it's, it's in some cases it's very difficult to to get to the bottom of why events are happening. Uh, so something that came in from the street, we move somebody into a unit and uh, it may have access to them and weren't aware that somebody had an issue or a problem. Uh, so we need to get much better at our intel gathering so that we know who's in our custody, what are their issues or problems, and how do we separate our gangs in a safe way. And I think everybody's aware that we have, you know, we, we have the general gang issues, uh, the general big name gangs like Crips and Bloods, but there's subsets of those gangs also. So it's not as easy to say, oh, this guy's a Blood, this guy's a Crip. It's also subsets of those gangs that, in some cases, have had issues that are carried over from the street. So from our view of this, it, it really is uh, getting much better at identifying those inmates who may have issues or problems or those inmates that are, have a propensity of violence. And we think enhanced supervision will help us get there. But uh, as everyone knows, we've got 17 inmates in enhanced supervision today. So as that rolls out farther, I think we'll, we'll get much better at it. Great. Yes. Michael. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Of, of, of all the statistics, this one really is really scary. Yeah. And is it because of better reporting? Is it because of more effective smuggling techniques? Is it because of, are there factors? I get the game stuff, right? Right. It, it's, it's just saying, when you look at starting in uh, whatever it is, 2009, right. and see this yes. unbelievable slope, is, is there, are there other issues to consider uh, as you as you administrate the department, you know, I think for us it is part of our overall population management plans. Be it gangs or it's just violent, it means we, we need to get much better at identifying and putting risk factors on inmates. So we have we hired a, a uh, individual from Connecticut system and is going to be the lead on developing our population management plan, which should be give us a much better uh, idea on. Who's at risk? Who are the real high custody people now? I think our high custody scores right now, typically you you manage population by custody level. So low custody, medium custody, and high custody. Right now our high custody inmates are from 13 to 30 something. That's kind of the, that's the program that we currently have. We think that's way too big of a range. So we need to get much better at narrowing that range so the people who are truly, truly, truly violent and need better oversight to separate them from the others. We're in the process of developing that system. It's probably going to take us a bit to do that. But I've asked the uh, first deputy commissioner, in the meantime, we need something in place today that begins to identify these issues and, and have an extreme look at oversight as to, when we're talking about at a deputy warden's level, of who's moving inmates, who's authorizing the move, and the thinking behind the move. As you drill down to these incidents, I always kind of look down, is this preventable? Is this something that we could have seen had we looked at this in total? Many times you look at these cases and it's a gang issue or something from the street or somebody new coming into a unit that there's got to be a way that we get better at this, both from gathering intel, interviewing inmates, and making better judgments with a, with a classification tool. Is, is, the, is, the gang, is the gang investigative group, is it, is, it, is, it, is it the same size that it was in 2009, 2010? It, it just, I, I, I was out there in those years. Right. You know, even among some of your predecessors who aren't politically uh, correct nowadays. Commissioner Carrick had a very aggressive gang investigation journey. Is, is, is do, you, do you have the right, is this a resource issue? To a, a small degree, I, I think it's more of a skill building. Uh, you know, getting part of when we looked at the gang unit when when I arrived here, we did very little consistent training. So you got on a unit depending on what you came in from a background. You may have learned a couple of things. We may have sent you to training. We may not. So as we re retooled the unit and remissioned them, now we kind of trained them up to the task at hand. So. It may be a resource issue, but at this point, it is a skill building issue on how to gather that intel and, and how to uh, really manage that very difficult population. Thank you. I mean, if it's a resource issue, we do have resources to apply to it, but the training piece is more concerning to me. People have not been trained in the roles that would put them into it. Just, just historically, that gang unit and your department has done an extraordinary job. So if, if, you, if you look at issues of terrorism, if you, if you look at issues of Al-Qaeda, if you look at issues 
the, 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 the work that the intelligence unit, I think, has done has been extraordinary over the years. And if it's time to, to, to strengthen it up, I think it's something to, to, for you to consider. Yeah. I agree. I think it's, it's it, lost a lot of You yourself to the jails in California. Right, absolutely. Right? It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's you're far, far, far better. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Bobby, I just, just like to, to comment. I mean, I, we don't have this on a on a on a slide to, to project, but this is this is a, a graph of use of of, uh, of monthly injuries from fights with rape per, per year. And if you if you look at, at this graph, uh, you see that that except for the, the last couple of months, which have been very high, that, that the, the rates have been quite similar going back to 2006 from now. So we're, we're, we are not dealing with something, I mean, there are some numbers which are very high, but in terms of actual injuries, the, uh, the, the rates are, uh, are um, you know, the, the, the rate per 100,000, uh, 100 inmates in 31 days was 0.133 in 2006, 0.123 in 2011, 0.142 in 2013. This year is high, but it's just a two, it's a, it's a two month. So, so violence, um, I think, is a characteristic of Rikers Island, uh, and it's very important to, uh, to, to to minimize it. But but we have to we have to look at the um, uh, at, at at things occurring over time. I think as well in order to get a better handle on. Uh, question about overall, and then Commissioner, if you could just uh, address the issue of the not total, but many of the jails the last week in terms of the uh, lockdown, and in which the department actually requested uh, a variance from the board. So we'd ask to go into the executive session if they have that discussion. Okay. Can we ask some questions? Yes, about yes. That? I do have a couple of questions. When, when we just so that we understand the impact of the lockdowns, when the jails are locked down, are the inmates produced for their court appearances? Because we know court adjournments are often three months at a clip, or if the inmate has his trial going on, if it if he can't be produced, there's there's really serious repercussions for the inmate from not being produced. So, are the inmates who are due in court being produced? around the city for their court appearances during all these lockdowns? Yes. Yes, they are. They are. Okay. Bobby, uh, two other questions. Um, in, uh it's the, the newspapers have talked talked about this, and uh, that the use of force uh, on Rikers Island has increased dramatically over over, over the past um, over the past ten years. There's been a consistent increase, and over the past uh, four years, you, you only you only got one year, but I mean, but over less than that. But uh, but over the past year, in 2015 so far, and 2014 um, and 2013, you know, the rates went uh, went up from 0 0.8 in 2006 to 1.3 in 2011 to 2.4. 2013 to 3.2 uh, last year, and this year they're 3.7. 3 um, can you comment on what what that what that means to to you as the as the commissioner that the that the that the inst the, the use of force by your staff um, uh, is going up so great while the it, it simultaneously the incidence of, of of violence is not going down. And I also just to link that, which is hard to link. You've, you've changed the uh, your, your predecessor, and you've continued, I think, to change the lock in to 9 p.m. Um, when as we look towards controlling violence on Rikers, as we look towards you know working with you to decrease violence, uh, what does it mean when the rate when you do something like that and the rate of violence doesn't uh, doesn't does, doesn't doesn't change? They're two separate questions. I apologize for linking them that way, yeah. but so I, mean, yes, I, I think it's an unfair yeah. link. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just, just scratch the second part. To look at. Uh, staffing levels yeah. at certain times of the yeah. day, and our staffing levels after 2100 are much different than. Okay. But so the, the issue for us is that we, we need to really fundamentally do find a different way of how we do business. We need to find a, you know the, the uh, overall custody management tool will help us, meaning that the staffing for certain levels and custody of inmates will be much different than others. And once we do that, and we do a housing model, we'll identify where these more problem inmates are, train our staff up how to manage those guys, then I think we get much better at it. But part of the issue is that it's almost like one size fits all. So if you're in a high custody cell block, it's one officer for 30 or 40. If you're in a medium custody cell block, it's one officer for 30 or 40. So we really want to put our resources and train our staff up to deal. It's different, you know, to deal with these high custody guys. And we can do that, and staff should be trained up for that. And if people are using used to dealing with low custody inmates, and you put them in a high custody part, they're, they're going to have to. So we, we need to get much smarter about how we assign and how we train our staff, but build a model where the facility basically is designed and functions as a high custody facility 
All the staff know how to deal with that high custody population. And we don't just by accident filter somebody in who wasn't trained and didn't know. It's a, no, it's a very, uh, as you guys know, it's a very complex problem. There's no easy answer. There's no officer that we have working for us wants to go to work and uh, deal with violence every day. Everybody's on board. We need safer jails. So we have, you know, we're going to roll out a plan with the mayor this week to talk about an overall 14 point plan that has, will have significant impact on the violence. It's not quick and easy to not say we want to do it and it's going to happen. It really is missing the department much differently. Uh, have an overall housing plan, look at all of our training scenarios. Look at that. You know, we just started, I want to say about three, four weeks ago, to take our video stuff and start showing our captains every week now good and bad ones. All right, this is this is a good one, this is a bad one, this is what you can do differently. So some of these models will take some time to, to generate, but I, I know we can make have a positive impact. I know everybody's on board, you know, all of our unions are on board. You know, we want a safe environment, safer staff will be safer environments. Thank you. And then it'd be helpful to hear from Dr. Venters in terms of the impact, in terms of the lockdown, in terms of um, <coughs> medical and mental health services, Dr. Venters. <clears throat> sure, good morning. Um, <clears throat> as we've talked a little bit offline, uh, the lockdowns that happened on the third and the fourth uh, of this month uh, did have an impact on <coughs> all the different types of encounters. And overall, uh, when we, units and settings where we have staff inside housing areas, those tend to be insulated from the potential impact of lockdown. So for instance, mental health encounters we looked at, uh, and we didn't see a big drop off uh, in the units like CAPS and PACE, mental observation units, where we have staff in the units already. Uh, we looked at sick calls, uh, and we looked at medical follow-ups. So uh, for those two types of encounters, we did see a drop off, and our comparison is looking to see uh, this was a Tuesday, Wednesday, two-day event. We compared them to Tuesday, Wednesday uh, encounters for uh, the prior months, uh, the month of February. So uh, for the sick call encounters, we had between 22 and 38 percent drop off. Okay. And for the follow-up encounter, sorry, for uh, discharge planning, I apologize, I said another call for discharge planning. So that's people with HIV getting discharge planning services, people uh, with mental health problems getting discharge planning services. Uh, we saw uh, between a 24 and 46% drop off. So when we talked to the site medical directors, directors of nursing, uh, health service administrators, we didn't actually identify any individual cases where we had uh, morbidity or certainly mortality related to these drop-offs and encounters. What happens is that as soon as staff and leadership become aware of a lockdown, they start a process of triaging to make sure that the people that most need to be seen uh, are seen. And because this was a time-limited event, we treated it a little bit like we would treat a snowstorm, where we're able to you know, find the most important Encounters, get those done that day of, or get them done the next day or the day after. So, we also, since this, have instituted a very helpful notification system with the Department of Corrections so that, you know, as of this morning, there was a very small lockdown in one of the facilities, but they're notifying us at the outset so that then we can quickly uh, reschedule people and also work with uh, corrections to see the people that we can see on that day. At our last meeting, um, Dr. Venters, you um, you said you hope to be able to provide us with some new information regarding RHU um, at, at, at this time. I know uh, I visited RHU with Mr. Cephas uh, uh, two weeks ago, I guess, and um, it hadn't changed uh, in terms of the lack of access to, uh, to, to mental health services. Um, I wonder if there's been any progress or uh, it's an area, of, uh, as, as our staff have found out and, and as you're aware as well, of increased violence. Um, looks like Maui, acts like Maui. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, yes, we completely agree. We've had, since the last meeting, uh, in this short cycle between meetings, we've had several very productive sessions with uh, just a small number of senior uh, correction staff and health staff. We actually would like to sit down with uh, a couple of you to talk about some of the, the core elements, I think, from the, I think there's some core principles that we agree on. So we don't have a plan all fleshed out uh, for the new approach to replace the, RA, the restrictive housing unit, but I think that, you know, first of all, I think we can all agree that people who benefit from behavioral programming, behavioral interactions, uh, interactions with mental health and security staff to elicit better behaviors, that can't happen in a solitary confinement setting. It needs to happen in a more lockout setting. 
where we can do the program. So I think we all agree on that. We also agree that because of the reforms uh, really ushered forth by you all in the Department of Correction, what used to be designed as a six to eight week program, really now we need to adapt, we need to change that to people are going to be coming, to all, all these units, people will be there in a much more transitory state. So we're talking about two, three, four weeks. And so we need to <clears throat> change the, the RHU approach so that we can engage with people briefly. And for those that are kind of reciprocally engaging with us, have a have probably some points of contact in a therapeutic setting that's more lockout, but also continue that as I go back to the general population setting. And third, we certainly agree with the Department of Correction that when they have uh, a patient, or from their perspective, <coughs> they poses a grave security threat, they need to be able to put that some that person somewhere quickly to minimize those security concerns. So those are kind of the core elements of what we agree on. We do have, uh, you know, we have some discussions that have gone further than that, but we do want to sit down with you all uh, to explore it because it's a very complicated, we're just looking at the data, the number of people, for instance, who have, who are in the mental health service, who then are found guilty of a grade one infraction. So that's actually quite a large number of people. And so uh, what we were hoping for is the next step is to sit down with you all, share in a little bit more detail what we're thinking of, and come up with a plan that uh, both agencies and the board uh, can support. Okay. Thank that you very much. That's good. <clears throat> Any other Questions for the board around the issue of jail violence? Okay, thank you. The um, next issue of the agenda is adolescent and young adults, and um, Brian Hamill's been taking a lead role, so Judge Hamill. Yes, good morning, everyone. As we all know, we've uh, ended solitary confinement for 16 and 17 year olds, so we have no youth in solitary confinement. Effective January 1st, there's been an agreement by the commissioner in the city that will end solitary confinement up to the age of 21, including 21. That's provided there's sufficient funding, and we'll talk about that in a few moments. And from my looking at the um, data on ESHU, I don't believe we have any young adults under the age of 22 in ESHU. Is that correct? So no, none have been moved in. Um, I really want to commend Commissioner Pont and his entire team, Chief Perino, Wynette Saunders, Warden Collins. Um, I mentioned in January that the commissioner set up a um, adolescent advisory board that is made up of Department of Correction staff, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Department of Education, CUNY colleges are represented, um, ACS is represented, youth advocates, foster care agencies. It's really an incredible collaborative effort that Commissioner Pond has created at trying to bring about meaningful, sustainable reform that's modeled on juvenile justice. There is a programming subcommittee that's chaired by Vinnie Schiraldi and Wynette Saunders that have been focused on developing the programming to submit to the city, to City Hall for approval for um, the budget. And I think I'm permitted to say we're talking about probably about $20 million for the programming for adolescent and young adults. Um, with the ending of solitary confinement, I certainly am seeing a huge cultural shift at RNDC. And I know it's not easy, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Many of these things are not in place yet, but this is where it appears to me that the city and the departments are going. And that's developing and incentivizing a behavioral management system, programming, structure, idleness reduction, much more training for staff, better staffing, family engagement, which has been added, more exercise, physical exercise, more therapeutic services, clinical services to truly create a juvenile justice model. Before we talk about some of the problems, what I can tell you is in terms of the adolescents right now, they have a ratio of about 15 to 1. There are a few administrative segregation units that we've talked about before, the Second Chance Housing Unit and the TRU, which is now called the Transitional Restorative Unit, and there are two of them. We'll talk about that in a moment. This we learned at our advisory board meeting yesterday, the Massachusetts Department of Youth Services, some of which staff are here. We met with the commissioner and his top staff, and we understand that the true unit out at Rikers is modeled on their assessment and stabilization unit uh, for dangerous and or difficult to manage adolescents. They are, and best we can tell, they are keeping to the 14-hour lockout, applying clinical services, closed supervision, and until recently, and we'll talk about that, all of the youth were going to school. 
and it's my understanding the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and Corrections is still working on coming to an agreement on some of the issues in the policy directive and operation manuals and that really has to do with the use of the de-escalation area the lock in there but it's my understanding that that space is not really being used they're separating the adolescents now there have been some recent problems in RNDC with violence so I'd like to turn to Chief Perino if you can inform us what that has been what you believe the cause is and sure. how the department is addressing it sure judge um, starting December, when punitive segregation was no longer exist, I guess the adolescents wanted to test. You know, there's no more punishment, so they kind of got had them free to do, you know, fight and uh, utilize force. Uh, our uses of force um, throughout the year really started in February at almost 100, and we've consistently gone down to uh, our lowest levels in October to 30 which was a huge, huge improvement. And that was based on the custody management level, training of staff, so many things went into uh, that reduction that we were so proud of. But what happens when you, uh, when you give up premium segregation, uh, you're a tool that you were utilizing for some of the real uh, adolescents that have behavioral issues, now no, no longer in punitive segregation, they have a tendency of fighting and, and utilizing force. Our December use of force spike to approximately 70, which was the only, pretty much the only spike we've had within maybe nine months since we started our program. So what we've done was we uh, addressed it, we've uh, stayed up as many housing areas as possible, training staff, we've done several things, addressing the supervisors, addressing the adolescents, everybody getting involved. And we brought that use of force the next month to 60. And in January, uh, it was February, our use of force went down to 54. So we're going in a very good trend. And that's basically, uh, as our friends from Massachusetts said, we're going to have a spike when we make this change. And we're addressing it. Uh, we have two units, second chance and true and correct. We're not utilizing de escalation. We're not utilizing any of the uh, techniques that have been utilized in other areas until we have it written down, until it's agreed upon, until we, as a team, you know, with our meetings and stuff, decide this is this is the model that we want, and then this is what we're going to do. Yes, we might have gone too quick, eliminating punitive segregation without building this model, but we feel uh, punitive segregation wasn't working for adolescents, and I think everybody in RMDC is very proud of uh, the progress that, that that that's actually happening. Our our we talk about our uh, uh, fights that we had. We had a pretty decent fight in the school on February 27th. The school actually has been a, a, a place where kids have been going to you know, uh, school and they haven't been fighting. It's almost been a place where all fights are off limits. But on, on the 27th at approximately 9.01, we had uh, housing area th uh, three main. No, actually it was one main south walking to their uh, class. And they took the opportunity to rush into uh, uh, classroom 68, which housed uh, um, a group which was three main south, which is basically uh, a lot of bloods were in, in that particular housing area. In one main south, the, the, the group that rushed in, there was a lot of Trinitarians, so we believe it's security risk group related. There was uh, 10 kids in one central south rushed into the classroom with 12 kids in three uh, central south, and you could, um, you could believe what, what happened. Chairs were picked up, thrown, Teachers were very upset. Uh, staff acted very quickly and professionally by utilizing chemical agents, and uh, we reviewed the tape and you know takedowns and and secure holds, and we got it under control pretty quickly. But you know, seven correction officers went out to the hospital and one captain. You know, and uh, what we've learned from that, that was Friday. We brought all the teachers, anybody was there, all the officers. We squished everybody into the warden's office and we debriefed and we wanted to know how could we do this better. We also reached out to our friends in Massachusetts, you know, who's been our, you know, uh, really partner in, you know, transitioning. And they were on the telephone and telling everybody, it was about 40 people in the warden's office on that Friday, you know, that this is going to happen, this is what we should do, giving us ideas, just to calm everybody down, to bring everybody on the, you know, to bring everybody back to where we were, because our school was very successful and we really haven't had much violence at all in it. By splitting up the days, by having less adolescents in the school, that's been a, a, a really success for us. 
Can I just, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I want a question when you're, so you talked about that you haven't um, headed down the de-escalation path until you agree, everyone agrees on the protocol. When do you see that actually taking place? <laughs> Well, uh, hopefully in the very, very near future. We, we won't do anything until it's, you know, until the board decides that our policies are, are with, where everybody agrees on it. So we're at the moment building, working with Massachusetts, working on their plan, working on different jurisdictions to find out what's the best course of action we can take, the best, we want to be the best in, in, in the uh, states, and we're robbing everybody. Sorry, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to rob everybody to get the best, but, you know, if we're not going to just jump in and do it. It's got to be authorized. It's got to be agreed upon, and it's got to be a very set program. Because I'm sure this program, after we bang it out for the 16 and 17 year olds, we'll be looking to move it on to the 18 and 21, and and we're going to get a good foundation. Even though, I mean, everybody would admit that punitive segregation ending it without having something set might have been not the exact best thing to do. But we're here now, so what do we do? And we're trying very hard to keep the violence, keep all these adolescents as safe as possible, get them to learn in school. You know, all the officers in school really want these kids to learn. They, they, we're trying to change the culture. For the last hundred years, we've been treating adolescents as inmates. You know, so now with a, a stream culture change, we want to engage with them. We want the officers to build relationships with them. Back in the day, you build a relationship with an inmate, you're, you're going to get fired. You know, you play cards with an inmate, you're going to get fired. So we're changing this culture that's been ingrained in our staff for the last hundred years, and it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but I really truly believe we are in the right direction. And we got the right commission, and we got the right people on top, and, and this is gonna work. Derek, uh, and then Bobby. The fight you described at the school, um, what would you say were the causes of that, and were there any particular lessons learned of a more global application going yeah, forward? I'm glad you asked that, because uh, we can sit in a room and say, well, this is what we're gonna do, that's what we're gonna do, what we did, was we brought the teachers in that Friday and we brought the teachers and the officers also in that next Monday. And we asked them, what, what do you feel will make it safer for you? We found out that um, the chairs that are metal haven't been bolted down yeah. forever. So they said, if we can bolt it down and then they'll pick up the chairs and feel a lot safer. So we reached out to our maintenance and SSD and we got welders all over the department. We have about 80% of the chairs now mm -hmm. bolted down. And we also utilized the DOE to, uh, one of the teachers was an architect, and he, he planned out each room how it would work best for the teachers. Because it was their idea, it would make them feel safer. And also, they were able to rush in to that room, um, basically because the doors that were there, the locks that were there, uh, weren't functioning properly. So what we did was, even though they were very expensive, we bought, all brand new locks that allows you to leave from the out inside, but you can't rush in from the outside. So uh, we were able to uh, focus our attention on getting the proper stuff, fixing it. And this is basically from putting the teachers and the officers all together and saying, oh, what is it that's gonna make you safe? These were their ideas. You know, you would think they'd be our ideas, but they've been doing it for so many years and, and they just you know, cried for like, if you could bolt down those tape, those chairs, we feel a lot safer. And the truth of the matter is if there's, if there's no safety, if the kids don't feel safe, and the teachers don't feel safe, and the officers don't feel safe, how, do, how can anybody learn? You know, so getting it from them, you know, and they feel really comfortable. I spent the whole week up there, you know, in the school, with my warden, talking to him, walking around, looking to see what else you think, you know, you know, maybe we should set it up this way, that way. And, you know, most of their ideas came from them because that's where they're, they're doing. So I, I really feel confident, you know, between that and the staffing that this was a one-time thing. Basically, they, one of the kids, Santos, was Asian out and was going to, you know, 18 and going to GMDC. So he got his group to say, this is my last day. Let's see if we can do something. And they just picked a good opportunity. You know, they pushed the officers aside and they rushed in. They just, they just took the opportunity. And how can we stop those opportunities? By slowing things down. Now we got the doors working properly. And now, you know what? They can't throw chairs anymore. And if you look at those chairs, the chairs are pretty big and they're metal. So I think, you know, locking them, securing them down was a, a, a really good push at the point. How are your officers doing? Officers are doing good. I went to the hospital uh, that, that, that day. Um, some had gowns on because they were getting x-rays and stuff. But thank God their spirits were up. And, and I think bringing them in, because they were part of the group also that night, to say, listen, you did a great job. 
We looked at the video. No one's just swung any punches that I saw. They're all holds and, and, and grabs. And, and to make something clear also, there was a lot of respect up there from the inmates, the adolescents with the officers, because none of the adolescents were throwing any punches at the officers. They were like, come on, move away. I want to get in there. So there's a lot of respect that's, that's happening with our adolescents, with our officers. That maybe wasn't there before. You know, they were actually trying to push your officer away before they threw any punches. But it was clearly an SRG related thing and they just took an opportunity because this one individual Santos wasn't going to be there for a while and he roused some of the guys up and says we got to do this now because this is my last day. Yeah. Bobby and then Brian. Well, I don't finish no, no, go ahead. I have a few, few questions. Um, and I don't know if you have the answer to this but I would appreciate knowing uh, how many of the adolescents and how many of the young adults um, uh, have low bails. If, if you could, if you could, if you have access to that information, I'm, I'm sure one of the things that does not improve behavior, um, I think, is uh, is taking young people and locking them up many hours a day. So I, you know, I know the city is, is thinking about this, but I would just like to, to know what the the bail range, are, if if you have access to that information, are for all the young adults and uh, and adolescents. Um, the second. Um, uh, question is: Do do the young adults and, and the adolescents have access to indoor recreation on a daily basis? Yes, or or, or or outside or both? Yes, they do. I mean, unfortunately, now because the weather has been so cold and brutal, a lot of them aren't going outside. But we do have a uh, we have a recreation center out in Sprungs, which unfortunately to walk out to the Sprungs is very cold. So those numbers have been kind of low. And uh, we have a, a downstairs gym. We are we're trying to repair our upstairs gym, which gives us more access. Right, right no, I know now, there are gyms. There are gym in the in the facility. Right, we have two. So yeah. we realize it would be nice to have two. So we're yeah. working on a plan to try to get that fixed. Is That's that part is that part of a capital program now, or is it there's sub capital yes. dollars? Yes, it, it is funded. Yes. Okay, and uh, my third question is: um, Are is there any process of? Um, of restorative justice that's that's part of your um, uh, approach to uh, an episode like you you, you, you described uh, yeah we're talking about that because that that seems to be the basis of everything I mean if we don't if, if we I mean the kids kind of realize that they did something wrong and but it's not major and it might be a bump in the road so you know everything that we've been looking into focusing on is restorative justice to have them get back into the community you know holding them back maybe keeping them out and doing uh, different uh, projects which they do in Massachusetts. They'll sit down for a day or two doing uh, workshops, you know, while all the other adolescents and kids are playing. So that's basically where our model is coming from. We just haven't been there yet. I mean, a model that's been, I mean, in all fairness, uh, they've been working on it for many, many, many years, and they're excellent at it. We just started. So yeah. we're able to jump many years just by their expertise. That's that's wonderful. I just want to link that to the Department of Justice report, which showed that, uh, which described um, years of violence directed against um, young 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 men uh, by the officer staff. Have you uh, had any approach to restorative justice in terms of the state of your staff? Well, I, I believe leadership comes from the top. So basically, they're our kids. That's how I feel, and I'm the chief of the area, and, and the captain, the chief, the warden that we pick feel the same way. So the people working there right now are hand selected. We just hand selected 15 officers right straight out of the academy. Before this, they were just like, okay, 20 goes to RNDC, 20 goes to GRVC, you know, all down the line. And if you had RNDC, you would cringe and say, oh my God, that's so, oh, it's the one. Right. I mean, I'll, I'll never forget when the chief told me I was going to RNDC as a deputy ward, I nearly fell off my chair. Okay, this is maybe 10, 10, 10 years back. So I understand how it was. It's no longer that way, you know. And we we had an interview. Me, the warden, Commissioner Saunders. We we actually sat down and interviewed 50 people out of the out of 140 that really wanted to go because they had skills to go to adolescents. And some of those were social workers. Some of those were teachers. Some of those were uh, school safety officers. So we had a really good pick of people that really wanted to come. You know, our jail is building to be a preferred command where people want to come not where people were trying to duck from. You know, so we're able to really pick the best for our adolescents to people. You know, not everybody can deal with adolescents. You know, not everybody really cares, but we have people that we pick and have passion. And we want our kids, okay, because they're our kids. They're going into our communities to get the best possible. So it's no longer their inmates, they're our kids, and we're here to do a job the best we can. And if we don't hand select the people, the officers that are going to be caring for them, then you know what, then what do we do? Brianne and then Jennifer. Yeah, just a couple questions. I want to confirm that the policy is still that all the youth go 
to school, correct? Notwithstanding what occurred, yes, that we we're not reinstituting self-study. So we refused to go backwards, even though we had that big melee, we refused to go backwards, so we're not going to go backwards. Our true uh, adolescents are going to uh, the school, and um, we're not going to go to self-study, we're not gonna send the teachers there. You know, the commission made it very clear, we have to put three offices on one adolescent to do it. Okay, and my second question has to do with the true unit. I understand there are now two true units. Can you tell us what occurred that caused there to be two a very units A very interesting ha thing happened because we didn't put into the equation that there's going to be incidents where we want to separate maybe two particular kids. In an instance, we had a slash that occurred on the 15th where we didn't want to put those two kids who conspired to hurt other kids actually together to conspire to hurt more kids. So we're like, oh my God, what do we do? You know, so uh, we all huddled up, it probably was a Saturday or Sunday, and we said, we gotta do something, we gotta do something quick. So we decided to make two true units, so if we have to separate two adolescents that together might really be harming themselves or other people responding to do bad things, then we're gonna need an area where we're gonna have to have a separate area to, to separate them. Now, if it comes to a point where we can go back to one, then it's a custody manager level, then we could do that. But right now, these particular slashes that were involved in hurting this poor kid, you know, we wanted them separate as we're trying to, uh, you know, bring mental health and trying to help them out. But we wanted them separate so they couldn't conspire to hurt anybody else. Okay. Jennifer. Uh, not speaking to the incident itself, um, but more so to your response, you're in the, the department's response. I want to commend you uh, for your thoughtful response, the immediacy of your response, and, um, what you what is being reflected is that you're embracing the complexities of these issues, the sensitivities, and uh, I think that it's uh, it's perhaps maybe the most humane approach that I've heard thus far in terms of looking at the issues from very uh, very different vantage points and then trying to act with a sense of urgency, but with an appreciation for all of the circumstances that must be addressed. So I just want to commend you and the department. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to, last thing, I wanted to give De Deputy uh, Commissioner Saunders an opportunity if he wanted to just briefly address all the collaborative reform Thank efforts you. that you've been leading. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Thank Chief Perino. Thank you. Really Thank terrific. You. So, good morning again. Um, thank you so much, Judge, for the opportunity, because I was trying to figure out how could I get up here to just introduce our partners from Massachusetts. We have the executive team here. Since April, as you may be aware, um, the commissioner has given us the opportunity to go and look at best practices across the country. And uh, we've, we've garnered a lot of support from different jurisdictions. But most recently, um, Massachusetts delegation, the Massachusetts Division of Youth Services, have been so supportive of us. Um, yesterday we were laughing because Commissioner Forbes from um, Massachusetts came down as well with his team. And I said, I want to thank you for taking my cold call. He didn't know me from anywhere. I called him and um, we got the task in April. I called him in May and said, hi, my name is Wynette Saunders. I hear that you're one of the top four um, Division of Youth Services and we want to learn from you. How can you help me? And basically he opened his arms, he opened the doors of his facilities, he gave us support. Um, and I'd like this, this opportunity to ask the Massachusetts delegation to come and just introduce themselves. Can you please come, Ms. Morton, Ms. Del Sullivan, and Ms. Del Curry. Just like to point out that this is all volunteer and they've come here and spent days of their time. We all know how we're all busy in these administrative roles. This is a real commitment. We thank them very much for this. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Greetings, greetings from Commissioner Forbes. My name is Barbara Morton. I'm the Regional Director in Massachusetts. I've been with Youth Services for 31 years, doing both the bail side and the committed, we say committed, I think you say sentenced here maybe. Uh, for juveniles, our age is seven to 21. We have a youthful offender bar in Massachusetts, so we're dealing with all different populations. We also run the community re-entry component and diversion opportunities up front. I, liked, I really like the question about bail and bail amounts. I'm also the state coordinator for the JDAI initiative, which is the detention al alternatives with the NA Casey Foundation. So we've been doing that since 2006, and we've created different levels of community placements for you on bail, and it's been very successful. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Dan O'Sullivan, I'm the Director of Operations um, for our region and just probably give you a quick history, but if I can just um, 
a little support for the the great people. James done a great job, and when that has been wonderful. But the group of people that put together to work with adolescents, and the only thing, if I can give you this to take from here, is you have to try to change your thinking and separate out adolescents from adults. I know by the law what it says in New York and 16, I get that part. But just like in your own houses, your adolescents, you treat a lot differently, and what goes into dealing with that. And people can just take that view going forward. And I will say in the time we've been here, everybody we've met from that they've selected that are working in those units from that we spent time with yesterday, from your wardens to your deputy warden, wardens to your correctional officers, to your teachers, I, I, they want to engage with kids, which is the key with kids. You can't have, the, you're there, we're here. They're good people that you know want to be in there, and that's the key with working with kids. And it's not for everybody, and what you guys have done, and very short period of time. You can see it already and you're going in the right direction. There's bumps and there's, you know, it's a whole change of thinking and some of the bumps that you see with the, the spike in incident. Kids test limits just like they do in your own home. You draw a line, they're going to go to the line and try to go past the line. And they're going to see where that ends. And, you know, and kids react without thinking a lot, whereas adults we can think it through and there's a whole brain development piece. But I just can't commend enough what the work they're doing open up and, and what they're trying to do. And I think you absolutely have the right people going in that direction. So thanks for having us. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Fred Hurley. I've been with the Department of Youth Services for 27 years. I am a facility administrator overseeing three buildings, seven different programs in those buildings, both juvenile boys and juvenile girls. I am also the PREA coordinator um, for our region and uh, we passed with 100% in our first audit this past summer. So we're looking to uh, forward to our second round of audits this year, actually in April. So uh, we prepare for that. But I just want to say um, I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to be here. Uh, again, I'll echo what Dan said that uh, these people are great. We consider them family. Um, I've enjoyed our visit down here. Um, it's an experience. Um, <laughs> Not much. Talking about the city. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, well, I got to see it around. It was a lot of fun too. But um, again, it's just uh, it is a cultural shift. Um, and these people are definitely, definitely on the right track. It's great working with them, sharing ideas, and being able to hear some of their experiences and sharing ours. And going forward, I hope we can continue to do that because um, we got to meet the kids yesterday, and it was a great time. We sat down. I was impressed in the math class. <laughs> where kids were going over examples, uh, one kid in the room didn't have his hand up and answered the questions that I couldn't answer. It was very impressive. So you guys are definitely, definitely on the right track. And so I would say stick with it. Let us be your friends and work together. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just want to say on behalf of the Board of Correction, I, I certainly thank all the assistance that you've been giving. I attended the meeting yesterday. You gave an excellent presentation. It was extremely informative to all of us, and we very much appreciate it. Michael? Just want to say thank you. You're not going to get us to change our mind about the Patriots. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. With the work project. Thank you. Uh, so um, we have our Massachusetts family, and we also have um, staff that will be going out to Maine at the end of this month and in April. And so we're still, you know, we, we've done a lot, but we have a lot of work to do. And uh, we're working very closely with both our internal and external stakeholders. And um, I also want to say thank you to Judge Hamill because you've been so supportive for what we've been doing. She's um, served as a sounding board for us. And we speak on the weekends, we speak on the week, we speak in the night. We're just trying to like really work together. And um, I really appreciate the teamwork. Thank you so much, Judge Hamill. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Our um, next agenda item is a request from the Department of Correction for renewal of existing variances, and this would be a request renewal for uh, two months until our April uh, board meeting. And the, uh, I guess it would be our May board meeting, is the first one is, and this is the, I believe this is in our packet, uh, BOC minimum standard 1-02 classification of prisoners. This would allow commingling in a special category adolescent city sentence and detainee inmates at RNDC. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. 
All in favor? Aye. The variance has been approved. The next variance is BOC minimum standard 1-03 uh, personal hygiene requiring detainees and punitive segregation to wear uniforms. Is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, the motion um, passes. The next uh, variance request is BOC minimum standard 1-03 personal hygiene uh, involving suicide smocks and suicide res resistant bedding. Is there a motion to approve? Moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The variance is adopted. And the last variance is BOC minimum standard 1-06, recreation, limited recreation for inmates in the communicable disease unit at the West facility. Motion to approve? Moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. The variance has been adopted. Thank you. And the uh, last item on our agenda is public comment period. Thanks, Ashley. And we have um, two people that have signed up. The first is Evelyn Litwick. Yes. For, pass. Okay. And the next is Ricey Doyle Evans. From Jail Action Coalition and Brooklyn um, Defender Services. Hi, sorry for my atrocious handwriting. Riley Doyle Evans from Brooklyn Defenders and Jack. Um, I'll just respond to two things quickly. Um, I want to thank Dr. Cohen for bringing this issue up. We hope that the department and the board and the Department of Mental Health and uh, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene will work together to improve sick call and mental health sick call procedures in ESH. The 9 p.m. rounding doesn't seem particularly effective in light of reduced staffing and extended lock-ins. Um, we hope that access to mental health will be something that they review going forward. Um, and then also just to follow up on that concern that we raised during the last meeting, uh, we hope that the department and the board can work together to reduce um, held over long sentences from before the rule changes. The department confirmed that they are going to hold that time over people's heads and holding over these long sentences for what could be years um, to live out sentences of 120 days just doesn't seem to make sense to us. And we hope that those sentences can be reduced to meet the new rules and that we can just get that backlog cleared away um, and not you know, live out punishment over the course of years after an incident happens. It's, it's not logical and it's not just. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would just say, I, I, I would ask the board staff to try to get that information for us um, as the time proceeds. Any other issues before the board? I want to thank everyone. Our next board meeting will be on May 12th and um, it should be um, here at the First Avenue. So I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Move. Second. Second. The meeting's adjourned. Thank you so much.